On this episode of the podcast, I have with me Hamid Ahmadi. He is the VP of Engineering at Carius. We're going to be talking about the challenges and opportunities in scaling within the healthcare and life sciences industry. Hamid has uh, some great insight into how you're going to build teams and some of the obstacles and also some of the opportunity that lay in front of being the, in that industry. I'm excited to have him on to talk to us about this. Hamid, thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely. So uh, let's start off with two things. So one, um, if you tell us what Carius does, and then secondly, if you can tell us what are your responsibilities as the VP of engineering? Carius was uh, started several years ago with the idea that it's not acceptable to see people die from unknown infections in the 21st century. We envision a world where infectious diseases are no longer a serious threat to human health, which, of course, uh, with the situation in the last year and a half, we know that this is a tough goal to achieve. Unfortunately, most of the traditional diagnostic methods uh, are not really effective in many cases, as they require knowing where the infection is so that you can test the infected tissue. For example, a bronchoscopy might be used to investigate lung infections. But Curious technology is different. It finds circulating microbial DNA in the bloodstream and matches that with the DNA of over a thousand known pathogens, almost regardless of where they are growing in the body. This makes uh, the Curious test a very effective and low-risk diagnostic method, especially for vulnerable people like those with a compromised immune system who can't go through invasive diagnostic procedures. I joined Carius as the VP of engineering over a year ago to scale and expand the engineering organization, which is responsible for the technology infrastructure, software and data engineering, corporate IT, and information security. Over the last year, we have grown from a team of six engineers to about 20 people across different functions. And our focus is to build a state-of-the-art technology stack that delivers our life-saving diagnostic method. Just to give you a quick snapshot of our stack, we build and operate software systems that run our specialized laboratory and analyze microbial genomic data to generate meaningful and actionable information for the physicians. We also have applications that our customers use to order our tests and receive the outcome of the test in a timely fashion. As you can imagine, genomic data is large and processing it usually is expensive computationally. So we have a fully cloud-based infrastructure that enables us to run our product effectively and support our customers. Awesome. Sounds like a lot going on, especially with the pandemic. I'm sure that is accelerating multiple timelines for you guys. So that's probably some opportunity and challenges to talk about. And I know you mentioned, you know, you've been there a year and I know before we were talking on our pre-call, we were talking about some of the, uh, you know, the challenges that are specific, you know, being within the health medical area, you know, being in the health and life sciences industry. And maybe kind of talk about it at the high level, you know, if somebody hasn't been in the industry and, and they're kind of thinking, all right, well, what makes it so different? You know, what are the challenges to, you know, the industry and some of those obstacles that you're referring to? Sure. Um, I would like to answer your question by highlighting a few factors in the context of this industry specifically. The first factor is really the importance of investment in the foundation of technology development and operation. That is the infrastructure, the processes, and best practices, or known typically as software development lifecycle, or SDLC. It's interesting, several years ago, McKinsey studied over 1,300 companies in various industries, and they found that the top performing businesses also outperform others in all aspects of engineering, including productivity, throughput, quality, and so on. When you drill down into that data, you actually find out that less than half of the life sciences and medical devices companies had deliberate efforts building engineering capabilities and following best practices, where the same ratio in the high-tech industry and software-first companies was about 70%. So clearly, we need to catch up in this industry. The second factor is really the regulations and mandates and compliance guidelines that the healthcare and life science companies have to follow, such as HIPAA and FDA regulations and so on. 
Unfortunately, most of the companies that I've dealt with see this as a limitation rather than an opportunity. You see that you know, applying these rules and regulations blindly without understanding their purpose actually limits the agility and productivity of the engineering teams without promoting additional quality. So it becomes really hard to attract talent when they think or the perception of this industry is that I'm going to go to a company, there's a lot of red tape, there's a lot of paperwork, I'm not going to be able to contribute as an innovative person and I have to follow orders. So that perception is one of the challenges that we have to deal with. The third factor that I wanted to highlight was basically the design of the organization, especially the engineering organizations, around what's needed to be done for the company. Especially in smaller companies, engineering organizations usually struggle with daily firefighting, keeping up with the constant stream of new requests and frequent pivots in the company. So in this environment, people naturally fall back to what they know because that's fastest to get to the results. And they leave uh, very little time and mental energy for experimentation and applying new ideas. So this basically reduces, again, the type of innovation that we see in other software-first companies. And the last but not least factor that I want to highlight here is or the silos that are created in this industry. Because of the regulations, a lot of companies are afraid or not open to sharing their code, their data, their best practices, and so on and so forth. And you see that people move from one company to another, and they have to repeat the exact same thing that they've done in the past, which in general reduces the productivity and advancement of the industry overall. Let me ask you a question. I know you uh, have spent some time within the healthcare space now, and obviously some of these things that you mentioned, you know, they are clear stigmas. They are some realities of having to deal with the FDA and regulations. When you're looking at somebody from the outside looking in and, and the opportunity of one and go, hey, I'm going to come in and, and, you know, there's a lot of growth. I can see what's happening with the pandemic. All these technology and solutions are very powerful. How do you position, hey, you know, that all sounds really great, but here's some of the core things that you have to realize that, you know, the regulations are there, you know, some of the the perceptions that you mentioned. How do you overcome some of those? I think focusing on the mission is critical because majority of the healthcare and life sciences companies have a mission that directly connects with every human being. And that is uh, whether diagnostic uh, a disease or helping with the therapy of that disease. So everybody out there has experienced in their family some sort of an health issue. So they can connect with the mission very easily. Another factor is just highlighting the regulations that are in place. They intend to prevent issues and problems with medical devices, drugs, and diagnostic methods. So they're in place for a good reason. But we need to be very you know, knowledgeable about those regulations and understand their intention and build our internal processes in a way that still promotes our innovation. So when I'm talking to friends or candidates who are interested in the company, I usually highlight the challenges that I just mentioned uh, previously, but also on the positive side, I highlight how much technology investment can actually overcome some of these challenges and take them to the next level and make them an opportunity for us to have a positive impact on human life. And I guess when you're looking, you mentioned, obviously, it's different than the high tech industry. When you're looking at, let's say, attracting a candidate who's you know looking at the Googles of the world and all of their high tech, and obviously Google just mentioned it, but you know, the Amazons, the Apples, and all the big tech companies, are you looking for a specific driver? Because obviously it seems like a mission driven is important for you, but it's got to be more because obviously on the surface, it doesn't seem maybe as sexy as industry, maybe more mission driven. Right. When I uh, made my journey from high tech to biotech, I was in the same seat, right? So I was investigating why I should join a life sciences company and what attracted me to that company beyond the mission 
was really the uh, fascination around human biology. So we deal with the edge of the technology in uh, humans' knowledge around biology. So we deal with DNA, we deal with thousands of microbes uh, that I personally hadn't heard of before or knew that there was such a disease uh, in the world. So not as an engineer, you learn a lot about organisms and disease and human body and biology along with applying your technology knowledge and the skill set to make that knowledge into a product that benefits people. So it is really interesting when you join these types of companies, the ramp up is not mainly about whether I know the tool set they use for CICD or for the infrastructure management. The terminology is new, the uh, data set that you deal with is fairly new. And the people that you have to interact with are also different. Uh, We have to interact with physicians, with pharmaceutical companies, with diagnostic companies. And these are all new areas that I think is fascinating, at least from my personal view. Obviously, I think uh, it's a completely different industry from, you know, I guess in your case, I know you made your way from Microsoft and into the biotech, health, and uh, life sciences industry. So you had to go through this process, which is good to kind of hear from your perspective. And I think some of the stuff that you mentioned, you know, dealing with the FDA and regulations, the stigma of, you know, do things innovate? Are they moving quickly enough? And then obviously then you have, you know, some of the concerns about, you know, ramping up an industry and, and dealing with you know, understanding what's happening, not just in tools. When you're actually going through that process of hiring and you're looking at candidates and you're going, hey, they have the right tools, they don't have the industry. Are you thinking, oh, I need to bake in lead time for this person really to get to understand my business? Or when you're hiring, is it typically, listen, you come in and you get the nomenclature as you go and it's not that big of a learning curve? I think um, there has to be some buffer time built into our onboarding for people who are not from this industry to understand the operation and how we deal with software development and releases. Our SDLC has a specific process to make sure that we meet and follow best practices and guidelines. But fortunately, in the past uh, few years, many of these regulatory bodies like FDA or associations like Association for Advancement of Medical Instrumentation, AAMI, have put out guidelines, updated guidelines out there to promote agile development and practices. So that actually helps with getting folks from outside this industry and ramped up quickly on the software development side when we explain to them how we apply agile development and risk-based development to our software practices. On the industry side, and nomenclature, they will learn as they go. We typically start from a very surgical focus. For example, a new developer comes on board. We focus that person on a specific area, maybe fixing bugs or just understanding the architecture and adding some minor features. And through that process, they learn, gradually learn the nomenclature and they have to talk to people with the context and background, and they learn that through. And then we expand their responsibility and exposure in other areas. So far, it has worked well. And I think both parties, meaning the new people coming on board and people that have been here for some time and are helping other developers to come on board, I think, enjoy the process because it requires a lot of collaboration and coaching and teaching. So that also creates a bond between people who are coming on board and just need a lot of collaboration with others in the team. Yeah, it makes sense. And I think, um, yeah, obviously, as they get deeper, we'll start understanding the differences in in the nuances. I know we had a client once that uh, did uh, assays and they had uh, a need for immunohistochemistry. And I think it took me uh, several attempts to try to get that uh, all out in one full sweep because I was like, it's just, just like the most letters in a word that you'll come across. And, you know, talking to people in the industry, they can easily start telling if you if you understand, uh, you know, what they're looking for and what they're not looking for. I guess when you're looking back now and you're kind of, you know, you mentioned some of the you know challenges, some of the opportunities. How much of the mission-driven side do people gravitate towards? You know, I think especially what you guys are doing now is kind of 
you know, come to the forefront of how important applying you know, technology to the health and life science industry, AI and ML solutions. How much of that mission driven is really drawing candidates to you guys? The candidates who are really interested in the company typically have a strong connection with the mission. We talk to candidates across the board for different roles, and really you can see and sense the excitement and the attraction to what the company does. The technology is on one side, as I mentioned, like uh, driving and developing technology at the edge of human's knowledge and biology, but also just knowing that your work, your efforts, even a simple bug fix or a simple feature that you put in literally touches a human life or more. That is very powerful, keeps uh, people motivated, keeps them really interested in the software development and engineering in these types of domains. I think um, in the life sciences industry, we need to put more content out there and showcase what folks in this industry do and how they connect with others outside. And as you mentioned, with the pandemic, now we're seeing the candidates who are talking to us can actually relate directly to what we do and what the outcome is for others. This is similar in other life sciences companies. Before Curious, I worked at a cancer diagnostic company. And a majority of people who were coming on board had an experience, personal family members going through cancer, and they had a very strong connection to the mission of the company. I think in a general sense, you know, healthcare and life sciences is something that is going to just grow over time with the environmental issues and variety of factors. So I think focusing on mission will be very helpful for attracting the top talent in this industry. Absolutely. And I guess flip side, so I know I definitely have got to be, you know, at the pinnacle of attracting people to join the mission because obviously there's so much visibility. I guess on the flip side, if you were going to pick maybe a couple of areas where people might get frustrated that's different than what they've come across in other industries, what would maybe some of those frustration points be? Because obviously you know, we've talked about the great aspects, the opportunity, but you know, what are maybe one or two things that you know, somebody should maybe know coming into it that they need to expect and you know, some of the bums they might see? Well, the experience may vary company to company, but let me highlight a couple of common threads that I've seen in the past and how I have dealt with them. One of the first things that people coming into the life sciences companies notice is an adjusted development life cycle. There are certain milestones that we have to hit before pushing any code to production. For example, the activities of software verification, validation, or post-deployment qualifications are in place to ensure that our product meets the expected quality of a medical device. Obviously, none of us wants to use a medical care or medical device that hasn't been properly tested or validated. So the concept of move fast and break things um, doesn't really apply here. We really strive for moving fast and saving lives. Fortunately, with the right investments, we can make this model a reality and we get as much as possible close to it. For example, we leverage a risk-based SDLC, which is designed based on the Agile principles. while meeting the compliance requirements. This means that we assess the risk of every change that we're introducing. And depending on the risk measurement, we adjust our testing, documentation, and release process. We are also investing heavily in automation, both at the infrastructure and testing fronts. For example, our blood sample processing flow in the lab, which we call it order to report, takes usually about one day in reality. It involves many systems, interactions with the users, so on and so forth. To increase our own development productivity and improve the quality of our product, we developed a simulation of this process that runs in less than two hours. 
So this gives us ability to quickly test our change and get a sense of the quality of the output going through this simulation and catch uh, bugs or regressions or issues very early on. Another speed bump that people may encounter in such companies is the organizational design and the role of engineering in the company's big picture. This is not uncommon in the companies where software is not the product that the company sells. And sometimes engineers may feel that they're not set up for success or to deliver their best, and they're just a service organization. The way to address this is to make sure that the business understands the value of proper software infrastructure and processes. Fortunately, in the last few years, life sciences companies are seeing data points like the McKinsey report that I mentioned earlier have realized the value of investment in the software development infrastructure. And now they're looking at a software engineering organization as a potential competitive advantage rather than just a service organization. I've certainly been lucky at Carius where we have a very supportive leadership team that allows us to invest in building a state-of-the-art infrastructure. I often use a Lego analogy to convey this message to my team and others in the company. Uh, engineering organizations are really building reusable Lego pieces with different colors, shapes, and utility. The business then takes these pieces and based on their imagination, product roadmap, or market demand, they assemble them to solve a diverse set of problems. This model not only empowers engineering organizations to be more agile, reduces the maintenance cost, and reduces the technical debt, but also gives the whole company a boost in agility and scalability. As an engineering leader, I've really enjoyed building teams in this industry with super technical and creative people, giving them the tools and the space they need, and just watching them go deep into problems in domains with really high uncertainty. It is really satisfying for any engineer to see these innovative Lego pieces fit together perfectly and create products that potentially save lives. Awesome, man. I think that's really insightful. And I think uh, it's good to kind of know, you know, there's a tremendous upside and, and kind of be prepared that it's going to be different. I mean, it's a different set of rules. It's a different industry. And uh, if you've ever worked at a company where software is the product and all of a sudden now you're working in an industry where the solution to the problem is built by software, it's a completely different uh, environment. So I, I appreciate you coming on and talking about the subject. And I guess if somebody wants to ping you, they're curious about uh, anything you said on the podcast, what's a good way of getting hold of you? Definitely. I uh, would love to get connected and chat with folks on LinkedIn. You can find me on LinkedIn. Our website is curiousdx.com. You can visit our website and see what products we have and what type of you know, development we do and would love to hear input and increase our collaboration in this industry. As I mentioned, it's really powerful to invest technology or the application of technology in human health and positive social impact. So we would love to get more of talented people in the software industry coming into this industry and help move it forward. Yeah, definitely. We'll include your LinkedIn in the show notes as well. And again, thank you for being on the podcast. And that's it for this episode. We'll be back again, different guests, different topic. Uh, two things I always ask for. One is if you find the podcast interesting or useful, please share it because that's how it's been growing and it's been awesome. And secondly, if you want me to find a guest to talk about a particular topic, let me know what the topic is and I'll do my best. Until next time. Thank you. Thank you.